couple, about five years ago, I ran across a little chart. And the chart, to me, answered the whole question. And here's the chart. This is a million years of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And we often hear, well, carbon dioxide naturally goes up and down in the atmosphere. Well, yes, it does. That's what these figures are. But for 800 and, or 900 plus thousand years, it ranged between 160 parts per million to about 250 or, or 275. That's the range. And then all of a sudden, you get up to the year 1000. It's still in the same higher range. And right here, 1860, when we started to burn fossil fuels in large quantities. And there it goes. And it goes to re levels that it hasn't, we haven't seen on this planet for three million years. And the last time we saw 400 parts per million in the, in the atmosphere of CO2, the temperatures were 12 to 14 degrees warmer, and the oceans were 60 to 80 feet higher. Now, this isn't politics. This isn't speculation. These are actual measurements based on the core, on the Greenland ice cores. This is what the CO2 concentrations were. And here we are at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Now, this chart, it seems to me, answers two of the three basic questions on this subject. The first question is, is something happening? Yes. In, in, inevitably, you, you just can't look at this and say, this point and this point are so different, and this is a million years, something's happening. The second question about this whole issue is, do people have anything to do with it? This is when we started burning stuff. This answers that question. Of course people have something to do with it. It's just too weird a coincidence to say, all of a sudden, when we started to burn fossil fuels in large quantities and release them into the atmosphere and increase the CO2, this, it just happened to happen at the same time. One fellow I know said, well, it's volcanoes. I'm sorry. We didn't have an outburst of volcanoes in the 1850s and 60s. We had little fires all over Europe. All over America, we had steel mills. We had the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. We've started to burn coal and later oil. This is what happened. Now, I remember I mentioned that there were three questions. One, is something happening? Yes. Two, do people have anything to do with it? Yes. The third question is, so what? CO2 is going up in the atmosphere. So what? What does that mean? Well, this answers that question. This is the relationship between CO2 and temperature. Red line is carbon dioxide, black line temperature, an almost exact correlation. If the CO2 goes up in the atmosphere, and what are we, we're about uh, 500,000 years, you can see CO2 goes up, temperature goes up. CO2 goes down, temperature goes down. So this is the answer to the third question, so what? The answer is temperature. OK, I don't think it's been discussed tonight. And that is that the ocean is becoming a giant sink for all this carbon that's in the atmosphere. And when the, when the atmospheric carbon dioxide goes into the water and is dissolved with water, it turns into something called H2CO3, carbonic acid. And carbonic acid attacks shellfish and shells they can't form their shells because the ocean is becoming acidic this is a recent observation and it's the result of the massive load of carbon that we've been putting into the atmosphere here's another practical result and the president talked about this in terms of Boston. These are charts that show what happens if the sea goes up varying levels. Six meters, one meter. One meter is dark red. Look what happens to Virginia Beach and North Carolina at just one meter. And that's predicted in the next 100 years as the sea level goes up. And then you look at all of these communities 
New York, Boston, Savannah and Charleston, Virginia Beach, Miami, Louisiana. And then you can multiply this all around the world. I don't know the percentage, but a very significant percentage of the world's population lives within about 40 miles of the coast, everywhere in the world. These are real consequences. And these are the kind of consequences that are unbelievably expensive and unbelievably destructive. Here's another piece of evidence is sea ice extent. We're now talking about the famous Northwest Passage actually existing. Ships can now go from the Atlantic to the Pacific across the Arctic because the ice is disappearing. Here it is just from 1979 to the present. This is evidence. This is data. This is irrefutable. Here's, a, here's a, essentially a, a chart of Arctic sea ice. The red line was the extent of the ice. It, that was the average place the ice was in 1979 through the year 2000. And here's where we are in 2012. And as it continues to shrink, Several things happen. The ocean levels rise. The acidification of the ocean continues. And there's a threat of the change in the ocean's currents, which would be catastrophic for many parts of the world. Another example is the Muir Glacier in Alaska. These two photographs were taken from exactly the same spot. 1941, here's the glacier. 2004, here's the lake. The glacier's gone. That's change. And that's a change that's the canary in the coal mine. That's the change that tells us something is happening and we ignore it at our peril. My eyes. Particularly in light of where we are here today, tonight, in this body and in this city. The Clean Air Act passed the United States Senate unanimously. In the midst of the debate, Howard Baker, the minority leader, the Republican leader, gave his proxy to Muskie. Can you imagine that happening today? It passed unanimously. Mr. President, we couldn't pass the time of day unanimously in this body. And yet it happened. And that brings me to a question that really puzzles me. How did this become a partisan issue? How did it come to divide us so cleanly along environmental lines? This discussion tonight is important, but it's all Democrats and people, Bernie and I, the two independents, Senator Sanders, a senator from Vermont, and I, the two independents, no people from the other party. I don't understand that. The leaders, the giants of the environmental movement in Maine when I was a young man were all Republicans. And when Ed Muskie got the Clean Air and the Clean Water Act passed through this body, it was with the support of the overwhelming majority in the case of the Clean Air Act, all the Republicans, including very conservative Republicans. Mr. Senator Buckley from New York supported the Clean Air Act. I don't know how this or why this became a partisan issue. Maybe it was because it was invented by Al Gore. I, 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 don't, I don't know. But somehow it's become this divisive partisan issue. And Mr. President, it shouldn't be. This is our future that's at stake. This is our children and grandchildren's future. This shouldn't be a partisan issue. In my experience, if we can develop a common understanding of the facts, we can find solutions. They won't be easy, but they're there. Right now, the problem is we don't have a common shared understanding of the facts. So what are the solutions? The market is one. Innovation, as Senator Kane from Virginia said, is another. There are ways to use electricity and generate electricity through innovation that will be much cleaner, support just as many, if not more, jobs, and help prevent this tragedy from befalling us. And by the way, it doesn't mean we can't burn coal. Coal is an abundant resource that we have in this country that is loaded with energy, but unfortunately, it's also loaded with CO2 and other 
pollutants. So I think part of our commitment should be intense research on how to use coal efficiently, effectively, and cleanly. That should be part of the deal. We're not trying to put any region of the country out of business or control people's use of, of valuable resources, but let's use them in the most efficient and effective and environmentally safe way, and that can be done in part through innovation. We have to help people to find the way. The final piece when it comes to solutions is this has to be international. I agree with my colleagues that say we can't just do it here. We can't just do it here. If we just do it here and nobody else in the world does it, China and India don't do it, then it's not going to be effective. We will have imposed costs on our society that will just simply make their businesses more competitive if they're ignoring these externalities, these realities of price. It has to be done through international cooperation. And I think the moment may be right. From everything I understand about the air quality in China, they may be ready to discuss this. They may be ready to take steps along with us, but we're going to have to be the leaders. We're going to have to show what can be done, how it can be done. We are going to have to inno inno innovate our way out of this, but we have to do it with our international partners. Air doesn't, movement of air doesn't respect boundaries. Our grandchildren and their grandchildren. And we're borrowing it from them. And we have an obligation, a moral, ethical, economic, and security obligation to pass it on to those people in as good or better shape than we got it. And that's what this issue is all about. Mr. Chairman, I deeply hope, Mr. President, I deeply hope that we can put aside the partisanship and the arguments, agree on the facts, and then have a robust and vigorous discussion of solutions. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be free. But it will make all the difference in the world to the people that we owe our best work to, the future of America and the world. Thank you, Mr. President.